But now, uh, here to bring us the, the latest on the operational view and his view of where he'll take our branch into the future is our branch chief, Major General Bill Gaylor. Okay, is this thing on already? I think it is. Hey, so before I came up, I said, hey, I want to jot a quick note down uh, for observations so far. Uh, first off, it appears as though the big red one was the only guys that got the nomination packets in. <laughs> that is absolutely incredible to John and your team. Very, very well done. Second observation was uh, when, when these soldiers come up and they receive their awards, they're very quick to identify all of their soldiers around them who are deserving of that recognition. Uh, that's a special thing. That is what makes our Army so great. It's about a, a sense of team uh, for a common purpose, and I'm very, very fortunate uh, to have uh, my battle buddies uh, here with me. Uh, of course, uh, Sergeant Major Greg Chambers, the Branch Sergeant Major, and CW5 Joe Rowland, uh, the Command Chief Warrant, of, Warrant Officer of the Branch. Just two incredible individuals who work hard every day for our soldiers, uh, and I am impressed with them more and more every single day. Now, the third observation, and I'll throw my note down, um, I get one opportunity probably to say uh, a last public thanks to somebody. Uh, totally unscripted, off the cuff, sorry. But Lieutenant General Kevin Mangum was just talking about how he has his DD-214 in hand now. After yesterday, and this is his last day wearing the Army OCP uniform, uh, and. At this opportunity, I'd like to say thanks for just three plus decades of incredible soldiering, leadership, mentorship, and friendship to every single one of us. So please join me in recognizing Kevin. Okay, if I could have a slide put up, first rule of briefing at Quad A is throw a very busy slide up that no one is going to question because they can't read the dang thing either. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to take a moment uh, to describe some context for you uh, about where we are. But before I do that, thanks to, to Bill and EJ for this summit. Uh, it is pretty phenomenal what we get done with industry. Uh, and it's special when you look back on aviation, you know, even the first Cubs getting shot down by the Navy, I mean, that's just phenomenal to look back at where aviation has come since 42. And even since our branch was formed in 1983, as we celebrate 34 years uh, as a branch, it is clear to see that everything we do is about the ground force. When you think of the vision for the branch, the vision for the branch is a professional, modernized force that I loved Drew Pappas's comments about our professionalism. That is solely focused on the ground forces whom we support to provide capabilities and options for combatant commanders through reach, protection, and lethality to win in a complex world. That is the vision for the branch. That is uh, why we exist. When we ever start thinking of a capability for our branch, it's not a capability for aviation. It's a capability for a commander on the ground. Every dollar we spend in aviation is a dollar spent for a ground force. We do not exist for ourselves. So as we look at this world that we live in now, and this is the context part uh, of what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to steal a few Tradox slides, the three across the top, 
because General Perkins does a wonderful job of describing the complexity of this world, things that we have observed, uh, things that we expect to see in the future, things that we must be able to do that form what we call the Army's operating concept. And then we developed a multi-domain battle concept for how to fight in the future. Our Army is a concept-based and doctrinally driven Army. So you have to look to the future, make some predictions about what we expect to see, and this is the context for that. So what do we see today? We see today battlefields that are becoming incredibly lethal and incredibly contested with actors that are tough to discriminate adding to the complexity of that battlefield. We've got technology advances that have really manifested themselves in extremely long surface-to-surface -surface capabilities of our adversaries. The ability to affect, disrupt, and in some cases deny in all domains. We have integrated air defense systems and proliferated capabilities that further complicate our operations in the future. When every potential adversary has watched our operations for the last 15 years, and they have developed capability to deny our advantage or attempt to deny our advantage. But there is risk of potential overmatch. That's why we have got to remain focused uh, and dedicated, and, and General McConville talked about things that are critical to us, and Drew talked about things that are critical to us. Um, they're spot on. We have got to continue to develop that capability. So we're going to see in the future, we're going to see threats that come as regular, irregular, criminal, terror threats, hybrid threats in all domains. It'll dominate or deny or degrade communications capabilities. Uh, the hyperactivity of social media causes the pace and tempo of a commander to be challenged. And we know that it will continue to be more lethal. But when you then look to what it is we still must be able to do, you still have to fight for information about terrain and enemy. You have to uh, maneuver to positions of relative advantage. You must be able to dominate either locally or broadly domains for periods of time to maybe have temporal superiority so that you can synchronize cross-domain effects to enable joint freedom of maneuver. That sounds very poof. Yep, and it is. But we have to translate that into a capability. So what you see in the bottom left is just a bit of a description of that Army operating concept, multi-domain battle. We then look at warfighting functional uh, assessments of how each warfighting function will fight. Aviation is part of the movement and maneuver warfighting function. That is by design. Every single thing we do is for a command, commander and his soldiers on the ground. When you look at what things aviation must do, there are three consistent required capabilities. We find stuff. We move stuff, people, equipment. And we kill stuff for a force on the ground to give that vertical envelopment capability, to drive the tempo of a fight, to present an enemy with multiple dilemmas. And we have got to continue to do that in the future. When you look at where we are today and the challenges we face, I'll talk a couple of them, but it's not a negative message because there are incredible people working every one of these issues and they're solving them as nearly as quickly as they come up. So we look at the budget. 
of course, the budget is the number one threat to readiness across DOD. We cannot go into a BCA in 18. That would put at risk many, many things, immediate readiness and modernization programs. And I know there will be speakers that talk that later, uh, but it is significant. When we look at pace and tempo of our forces, we are on about a 1.4 to 1 active component dwell to deploy time. And we have been for a while, and the trend is getting lower and lower. That is a challenge to maintain. It's a challenge to maintain readiness because now when you look at 33% of the forces committed every single day, you are either in the deployment, rotational force, desurf, global response force, or you just came out of it like John's team, and you have to reconstitute. Or you're the other third that's leaving next week to go do it. And the ability to train to a collective level will become critical because these threats that we see are not the threats of the last decade where it's teams of two will solve this. We need to rebuild, regain collective battalion level readiness. And I, and I must acknowledge uh, the efforts of Forcecom who have been uh, critical through the MAR process, the uh, maintenance or aviation readiness review process uh, driving some of that immediate readiness. We have seen the collective uh, aerial gunnery proficiencies and frequencies go up significantly uh, in double digit percentages. We have seen the maintenance OR rates increase all for the better. Uh, we have got to continue pushing collective readiness. When we look at all of our modernization projects, and I talked about the budget's impact of that, but we also have a function of scale. When you have 2,135 Blackhawks, 767 Apaches, 542 CH-47s, when you have, not even including the UAS Shadow Gray Eagle that we have in our fixed wing fleet as well, that is enormous in scale. And we must understand that across all compos that when we have a modernization and fielding strategy, that is in essence a funding strategy. Because if we had to fund by show affordability of every single one-for-one -one replacement, it's unaffordable. And you cannot show affordability through the life of the program, which is a requirement before you field it. So we spend a good deal of time trying to uh, adjust the monetization, fielding, and funding strategies so that we can bring in these capabilities. So we look across the aviation uh, equipping modernization strategy, the training strategy, the leader development strategy, the sustainment strategy uh, that Doug Gabram is going to talk in a bit. Uh, and we look at what do we need to fix, what do we need to update in terms of doctrine, maybe an organizational design, leader development training, uh, before we decide we're going to pursue a materiel solution. Uh, and, it, and it does reinforce that we are well linked when I hear Drew talk the improved turbine engine program and the future vertical lift because uh, I would tell you that where we are going in our modernization plan is necessary, needed, and is capabilities based. It's not a thing based, it's capabilities based. And we have got to stay very, very focused on that. When we develop that modernization plan in terms of the reach, protection, lethality, sustainability, reach in speed, range, endurance, agility, or maneuverability, the words matter. They mean stuff. It will translate to a capability. Uh, our priorities will stay absolutely focused 
and they will remain the improved turbine engine program. It will remain the Block 2 CH-47. It will remain aviation survivability equipment progress. We will continue to push our degraded visual environment solutions. We will continue to find uh, future UAS solutions and small precision guided munitions capabilities ultimately to field the capability of future vertical lift. And I think that is critical for our nation. Because when you look at a capability you want, everybody would bash the process and say, well, Gaylor, you ought to, you ought to write requirements better. Okay. The industry says, hey, you need to write them where I can test them easily. Okay. That, that's, it's challenging from all of our perspectives. From a requirements perspective, it should be, I want better than we have today for our ground forces. Better. No less capable, better. But to give more specificity, you have to describe it, potentially operationally. I want the capability to move one BCT over one period of darkness over an sig operationally significant uh, distance. I want aircraft that are quicker to the place of need on the battlefield. I want airframes that can transit the depth and breadth of a division and core battle space in the future of potentially 500 kilometers as quickly as we transit them today with 200 kilometer fronts. I want the option for a combatant commander to self-deploy with the speed necessary and range necessary to do that. I want the combination of size and maneuverability at the objective that mitigates threat exposure, that enables dart speed necessary to clear open terrain in a high threat environment before the threat system can transition to an engage mode. That can be supported with math. We have got to have a capability to protect our airframes and our soldiers whom we carry. And we have absolutely got to be able to carry more stowed kills on board our airframes. You got to operate in contested environments. That's kind of the operationalizing of a requirement. And that is exactly what we have got to provide our soldiers, Drew Pappas and his soldiers in the future. And we will stay focused on that like a laser beam. So it is uh, an incredible honor to watch what it is we are doing as an army, to watch soldiers and how they prosecute things today. We demand so much of them, and we're short. Not a surprise, we are short pilots at a time when so is the airline industry. Airline industry is 30,000 pilots short by 2026, and it becomes very attractive to look to the Army, the Air Force, and the Navy to solve that problem. But we have got to keep these quality people that we have because our nation's security depends upon it and we will work everything we can to ensure that we build back the capacity in all of our formations and that includes at Fort Rucker to train more you must put resources into Fort Rucker uh, because you the soldiers and your families are greatly dependent upon uh, and you are the treasures of our force. There is no modernization plan that makes a better person. You are it. And you are phenomenal. So, 
encourage folks to stay, encourage folks to continue to uh, accept challenges of sacrifice for our nation. Uh, for if we don't do it with threats that exist today, it might not be worth it. Because there, there are things out there in this globe right now, there are nations and entities that wish us harm, that are pushing to develop capabilities to do it. The good news really is you and the fact that we have the finest airframes today, the finest technology today, the best trained formations today with enormous capability already. Our modernization plan is nothing more than to give you added advantage, added overmatch, because we will need that in 30 years from now. So thanks to every one of you uh, for what you do here at industry, for what you do inside of the Army, what you do inside of your communities. Uh, it all takes a great team effort, and uh, this is where we get much of that great work done. So thank you very much. Above the best. Okay, we did have uh, one of the very, very key people for Quad A come in uh, during Bill's part, and Miss Dottie Keston is sitting over to our right. And uh, Dottie and her husband in 1957, sitting around a table, came up with this idea of Quad A. And please give Dottie a round of applause there. Even talking to, to her and the late Mr. Keston Art, uh, they had no idea that them sitting around having a few beers with some friends would turn into, into Quad A and what it is today. So thank you, thank you, Dottie.